Cicero, in defense of Sextus Roscius Vermeria, speech delivered in 80 before the Christian era, translated by Michael Grant, narrated by Max Latham, part 7. Now I return to that golden name of Chrysogonus, beneath which the whole gang has surreptitiously taken shelter. Gentlemen, here I am in difficulty, for when I speak of this man I don't know how far I ought to go. But equally, I don't feel I can say nothing at all. If I say nothing, I leave out a very important part of my argument. But if I refer to him, I am afraid that not only Chrysogonus himself, I don't mind about that, but others too may consider themselves insulted. Fortunately, however, the issues that are at stake in the present case do not require me to deliver any attack on the purchases of the confiscated profits, property as a whole for the case exhibits quite special and peculiar features of its own. Chrysogonus bought the estates of the elder Sextus Roscius. So the first question we have to consider is this. On what pretext did they come to be sold, or how was it possible for them to be sold at all? Now, by asking this question, gentlemen, I don't intend to link it to any general proposition that the sale of every innocent citizen's possessions is a scandal, because if a situation could arise in which such problems might be boldly and frankly debated, the late Sextus Roscius was not an important enough national figure for his fate to be singled out as a test case. But what I do want to know is how the actual terms of the law, which deals with prescriptions, the Valerian or the Cornelian law, because I am not familiar with the measure and do not rightly know its name, could be claimed to legitimize the sale of Roscius's property. Its text is said to contain the following provision, quote, that property of those who have been prescribed should be sold, unquote. But Sextus Roscius does not belong to that category, for he was never prescribed. And then comes another category, quote, the property of those who were killed within the enemy's lines, end quote. But as long as such lines existed, Sextus Roscius was within those not of the enemy, but of Sulla. It was only afterwards, when the fighting had ended and general peace had been restored, that he was murdered while returning from a dinner party at Rome. If his killing was legally justified, I admit that the sale of the property was also legal. But if it is clear that his death was contrary to even every single law that exists, ancient and modern alike, then I demand that you should tell me the right, the principle and the legal provision under which his property came to be sold. You will no doubt be very eager to ask Errucius, whom these remarks of mine are directed against, not against the man you would like to suppose, and in fact do suppose, for my whole speech from the very beginning has exonerated Sulla, and indeed his own noble character does that for him already. No, I maintain that the person responsible for the whole thing was Chrysogonus. He lied. He made the elder Sextius Roscius out to be a bad citizen. He alleged Roscius was with the enemy at the time when he was killed. He prevented the deputations from Ameria from informing Sulla about any of these matters. However, gentlemen, I have an extremely strong suspicion that the property was not actually sold at all, and let me explain to you the reasons why I have come to this conclusion. The law which deals with prescription and sales ordain, as I understand it, that the last day on which such operations could take place was the 1st of June, but Roscius's murder only occurred some months after that. How, then, can we be assured that his property was officially sold? Either, one must conclude, the sale was never entered into the state accounts, and so this crook is cheating us even more cleverly than we had realised, or, if it was entered, then the accounts must have been tampered with in some way, since it is quite clear that the sale cannot possibly have complied with the provisions of the law. Yes, gentlemen, I know it's rather early to develop this line of argument, 
You may well feel inclined to say that when I ought to be saving my client's life, I am merely attending to a hangnail. And indeed, money, property, is the last thing he is worrying about. He refuses to concern himself with his finances at all, if only he can be released from this unjust suspicion, this lying charge he believes he will find mere poverty endurable enough. However, gentlemen, I still have a few points I want to make, and while I hope you will give them your careful attention, I also want you to appreciate that I am now speaking partly for Sextus Roscius, but partly also for myself. There are some aspects of the situation which I regard as scandalous and intolerable in a general sense, and I believe they will damage us all unless we take measures to remedy them. These are the points that I shall feel obliged to mention to you on my own account, because they cause me a great deal of anger and distress. And then there are, of course, the other matters which relate to my client's cause and vital interests. Later on, at the end of my speech, I will let you know the arguments that he, for his part, wishes to raise, and the terms which he would be prepared to accept. But first of all, let us just leave Sextus Roscius out of the question for the moment, for I have certain inquiries that I personally very much want to put to Chrysogonus. To begin with, I would like to ask why the property of a blameless citizen has been sold, the property of a man who was never prescribed, and who was not, as long as he lived, among the enemies of Sulla, though these were the only people, without exception, against whom the law was directed. Why did the sale take place considerably after the final date fixed by the law for such transactions? And why did a property fetch such an extremely small amount of money? If Chrysogonus behaves as worthless, dishonest ex-slaves generally do and tries to put the blame for all of this on his patron, the attempt will be unsuccessful. For everybody knows what numerous people have committed numerous crimes which Sulla either disproved of or knew nothing about, since his attention was wholly engaged elsewhere with matters of the highest importance. We are certainly entitled to question whether it is desirable that events such as those we are dealing with today should get overlooked in this manner, and the answer, gentlemen, is that it is of no doubt desirable in the extreme, but it can't be avoided. We know that Jupiter himself, the best and greatest, whose will and command rule heaven, earth, and sea has often tormented the human race and ruined its cities, flattening its crops by violent winds and furious storms and dreadful heat and unendurable cold. But when these disasters occur, we do not attribute them to a deliberate destructive impulse on the part of a god. We prefer to ascribe them to the impersonal force and immensity of nature. The blessings, on the other hand, which are ours, and the light of heaven which we enjoy, and the air which we breathe, are favours which we are happy to credit to Jupiter. Well, this was a time when Lucius Sulla by himself was ruling our nation and governing the affairs of the whole world, when he had recovered our empire by force of arms and was consolidating its majesty by new laws. If, at such a moment, there were certain things he could not manage to attend to in person, it is surely not very strange. The human brain cannot be expected to obtain results which even the divine might is incapable of, of achieving. But, in any case, leaving the past aside, what's happening at this very moment makes it abundantly and universally clear that the man who built up the whole of this intrigue was Chrysogonus. It was he who arranged for the charge to be brought against Sextus Roscius, and it was he whom Erucius, when he offered his services as prosecutor, hoped and expected to do a service. The people who live in the lands of the Salentini and the Bruti consider they have a comfortable, conveniently situated place of residence when news hardly comes their way as often as three times a year. But here you have Chrysogonus making his way down to see us from his fine mansion located on the Palatine Hill itself and he can relax when he feels so disposed in another very agreeable house that he possesses outside of Rome. He also has a number of farms, which are all first-class properties, and all nice and close to the city. His home is crammed with vessels of Dalian and Corinthian bronze, including an automatic cooker, 
Akhuvebsa, which he recently bought at such a high price that passers-by, hearing the auctioneer crying out the sum, believed a whole estate was being sold. And the quantity of his embossed silver plate, embroidered coverlets, pictures, statues and marble is beyond all computation. Or rather, it adds up precisely to the amount of plunder from many illustrious families, acquired in times of violence and pillage, which can be contained inside a single building. His vast household of slaves beggars description, and so does the variety of their skills. I say nothing about the ordinary trades of cook, baker, litter bearer, and so on, but he also disposes of a whole host of individuals whose task is merely the gratification of his mind and ear. So numerous are these artists that the entire neighbourhood rings incessantly with the sound of singing and stringed instruments and pipes and with the racket of nocturnal debaucheries. In a way of life like his, gentlemen, the daily expenditure and extravagance and lavish entertainment that go on the entire time are unbelievable. But when you have seen what a peculiar house he maintains, these excesses no longer seem so incredible after all. If you can call it a house, rather than a factory of vice or a rendezvous for innumerable kinds of misbehaviour. And look at Chrysogonus himself, gentlemen. Take a glance at his curled and scented hair as he flutters from one end of the Forum to the other, escorted by a retinue of citizens of Rome, formerly arrayed in their Roman togas. Note how contemptuous he is of every single person in the whole world, except, of course, his own self, clearly convinced that he is the only man who deserves to be called human at all, and the most successful and powerful individual on earth. Nevertheless, gentlemen, if I cared to go into details about all the activities and projects in which Chrysogonus is engaged, I'm afraid that people who were imperfectly acquainted with the facts might think that I wanted to attack the aristocratic cause that has proved victorious in our civil wars. Certainly, if there was something about the case that I didn't like, I should be well within my rights in attacking it, for I am not afraid that anyone is likely to suggest, as I have ever been unfriendly to the interests of the nobility, quite the contrary. Everyone who knows me is well aware that what I wanted most of all was an agreement between the two parties, the equites and the senatores, but that, as soon as this became impracticable, I honestly laboured for the victory of the side which eventually prevailed. For anyone could identify the issue at stake. It was whether nobility or poverty, and I am thinking from the point of view of people's principle as well as their rank, should control our national affairs. In such a contest, no one but the very worst of bad citizens would fail to join the side whose success would guarantee both the dignity of our nation at home and its authority abroad. That this has been accomplished, gentlemen, that rank and office have been restored to the people who are entitled to them, fills me with satisfaction and great joy. And I know very well whom we have to thank for this achievement. We have to thank the will of the gods, the vigorous endeavours of the Roman people, and the wisdom and guidance of good fortune of Sulla. The punishments that were inflicted upon those who fought against him so determinedly are not for me to criticise, and as for the rewarding of the brave men who performed outstanding public services, it deserves, as far as I can see, nothing but praise, for those were the purposes, surely, for which we were fighting and my absolute devotion to the party that achieved them is something that I am indeed proud to confess. But let us just imagine for a moment that the objectives and war aims of this cause had been quite different, that they had instead been directed towards the enrichment of the lowest tier of mankind by other people's wealth, in order to enable these degraded creatures to launch a universal attack on the sanctity of private property, let us imagine, furthermore, that a total prohibition had been imposed not only on the contesting these measures in any way whatsoever, but on uttering even a single word of their condemnation. If that were so, the war, instead of resulting in the revival and rehabilitation of the Roman people, would merely have succeeded in reducing them to complete ruin and destruction. However, gentlemen, 
that it is not by any means what happened. By resisting such rascals, you will not harm the nobility's cause in any way. On the contrary, you will enhance its glory. For whereas anyone who merely complained about Chrysogonus's power as an existing fact might well have been suspected of criticizing the regime, to declare, on the other hand, that no power had been granted to him at all, to dispute, that is to say, his right to such power, amounts to a commendation of the current order, a condemnation commendation of the current order. And no one, I hope, will be so foolish or disingenuous as to say, if only I had been allowed to speak my mind, I should certainly have expressed a strong view about such a matter. But you can. In that case, I should have acted in such and such a manner. Well, you may. Nobody is stopping you. I should have passed such and such a degree in the Senate. Pass it, then, provided it does some good. Everyone will support you. As a judge, I should have given this or that verdict. Yes, 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 do so, and it will meet with universal applause, if it is really sound and just. While the necessities of the situation demand such a thing, control remains in the hands of one man. But after he had made various appointments and passed the required laws, the other people got their legitimate responsibility and authority back. And, what's more, the men who gained these prizes will be able to keep them for good, if they really set about things in the right way. But if they commit or condone acts of murder and looting, or excessive prodigal extravagance, well, I don't want to speak too harshly against them, if only to avoid the bad omen. But this I do feel obliged to say. If these nobles of ours should by any chance fail to show themselves vigilant and right-minded and courageous and merciful, then they will inevitably find themselves compelled to resign their distinctions in favour of other men whose possession of those qualities is less liable to doubt. So I will tell these personages what I ask you to do. Stop declaring that a man who has spoken truthfully and frankly has done any wrong. Stop making common cause with Chrysogonus. Stop thinking that, if he is injured, you too will have suffered a loss. Consider how scandalous and lamentable it is that men who even found the pretensions of the knightly order undurable are now able to tol tolerate dominion by the most worthless sort of slave. Formerly, gentlemen, it is true this dominion was directed towards other ends, but now you can see it is constructing for itself a very different road, preparing to follow an even more sinister route for it is planning a direct onslaught upon your own good faith, upon the sanctity of your oath, upon the justice of your verdicts, and these are almost the only things in our entire community that still up to now remain honourable and inviolate. Does Chrysogonus really believe that even here in this court of law he is not without influence? Does he have ambitions to extend his power into this field as well? What a shameful and cruel indignity that would be. And, heaven knows, it is not because of any fear that he might be justified in such an assumption that the idea fills me with anger. No, what enrages me is his audacity in even venturing to entertain the barest hope that he might have sufficient influence to bring about the ruin of an innocent man when he has to deal with the judges of your impeccable integrity. I cannot believe that the nobility roused itself to take possession of the state by force of arms merely in order that its members' freedom and petty slaves should not be let loose to plunder our goods and property. If that was the object that they had in mind, then I confess I was quite wrong to desire their victory as I did, crazily mistaken to approve as a non-combatant what they were trying to do. But if instead the victory of the nobility is to be regarded as a glory, and a blessing to our nation and to the people of Rome, then every good and patriotic Roman must approve strongly of my criticism of Chrysogonus, for people who choose instead to regard any attack upon him as an injury to themselves and to their own cause have totally failed to understand what the cause really is, and they have formed a low estimate, an appropriately low estimate of their own merits. For the cause, every time it opposes a scoundrel, becomes more and more splendid on each successive occasion. But the man who is degraded enough to give his allegiance to Chrysogonus 
To imagine that there is a community of interests between the two of them is inflicting an irreparable self-injury because he has cut himself off from all the glory for which the cause stands. However, I repeat what I have just said in my own name. The national situation, my own indignant feelings and the abominable way in which these individuals have behaved contributed to my determination to speak up. It is I who am declaring how intolerable these things are, not Sextus Roscius. He is accusing no one. Even the loss of his entire patrimony is not enough to make him complain. A farmer and a countryman with little knowledge of the world, he believes that all these actions for which you say that Sulla was responsible accords perfectly with the custom and law and universal principles of equity. All he hopes for is to be allowed to leave this court exonerated of blame and cleared of this dreadful charge. If only he can get free of the baseless suspicion that hangs over his head, he declares himself willing to endure the loss of everything he possessed and to endure it with complete equanimity.